right. Hello and welcome, everyone, to our fifth episode. Welcome, everyone, to our fifth episode of our Partnership Ecosystems Improvement Series. Uh, today, we'll dive into the value you as a vendor bring to your partners. We hope the dis discussion will provide you with the ability to build a more differentiated value proposition for your partner ecosystem. Uh, so today we have, as always, Gilles Esposito, who has worked in channel partnerships and alliances for more than 20 years. Uh, has experience with distributors, vendors, and partners, bringing a 360-degree view to the conversation on partner ecosystems. And Carlo Breda. And Carlo has spent three decades in the channel, passionate about partnerships and how companies can optimize the power of their partner ecosystems. And my name is Aaron Solomon. I'm the Director of Operations here at Gorilla. So, uh, so welcome everybody, and uh, let's kick it off. So I think we'll start the conversation today with uh, you know the topic uh, being uh, the value that the vendors bring to the partners. So let's start it off with uh, what do vendors, what should they that value as a vendor bring to the partner ecosystem? That that's that's a good one, Aaron. Uh, hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us. And hi, Carlo uh, and Aaron. Um, it's a good one because it's actually two questions. You know, what is uh, what is traditionally being done, and what should be done. Um, and and from experience, there's uh, depending on the vendors, of course, but there's uh, quite of a gap between one and and the other. And before I dive into this, I'm gonna let Carlo do his little intro if he has something to say about this but no no i'm galvanized by this conversation this is uh, <clears throat> probably the the most interesting uh, of the lot for me um and it's really where i spent most of my career is uh, is uh really considering this question uh you know what what is the value that you want to bring to the partners what do they really need what do they really want um are you giving them the wrong thing and uh you know so so it's a very very interesting topic and i think it never dies out you know it's never settled it's never a settled matter uh it, it always keeps on uh, evolving and changing and so i'm glad that we're having this conversation so um yeah why don't you kick off uh, kick it off jill with your initial thoughts well um so we we discussed this a little bit ahead of uh, uh ahead of this uh webinar it's uh uh and and as we've been doing for the past episodes of this uh, of this uh, series, we've talked about the evolution of the channel, right? And uh, and our things are um, vastly different today from a vendor partner relationship as they used to be, right? So there's a, uh, the 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 most important thing for me is to realize that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, partners were uh, begging vendors to uh, represent them. And uh, uh, there was room for every single partner to represent pretty much every single vendor out there. Um, and this has tremendously changed in three decades uh, in the sense that now there is a plethora of vendors out there uh, and partners don't know what to do with uh, all, all this uh, absolutely confusing and uh, overwhelming map of all the different, different vendors doing everything and all that, especially in areas like cybersecurity where the map is just crazy, right? And uh, yet uh, there is a constant, is that every single one of those partners, of those VARs or MSSPs or whatever, uh, have people that are, are going to potentially represent the vendor's interest and the vendor brand to try to promote yourselves and so on and so forth. But the constant is that there's still only eight hours a day for them to do that, right? So it's not anymore, uh, and I, I'm absolutely adamant on this, it's not any longer the vendors that are going like, okay, which partner do we want? No, we want you, we don't want you, and, and that kind of stuff. And all that. It's much more difficult for vendors today because the ball is in the court of the partners, and the partners are going to be 
very choosy and they're going to do that very carefully in their uh in who are they going to represent and uh, who are they going to partner with and therefore the ball is in the court of the vendor to make themselves way more appealing and uh, to the partners and uh just remember especially when we're not, i'm not talking here about the major vendors you have out there the microsoft the salesforce and all those people now they have an established brand they have um you know they have a solid foothold in their markets and uh, they're capable of having some form of leverage and i'm not using leverage as a negative here when it comes to their partner ecosystem i'm more talking again uh about brands that are brand new so scale ups and startups that are trying to scale their operation and, and sales operation uh, by appealing to uh, VARs and other type of partnerships that could help promote as quickly as possible uh, for a much lesser investment that they if they were going to do it by themselves, uh, trying to promote their sales and to expand their footprint on any given market, whether it being a geo or verticals or whatever. So in a nutshell, what this means is that you now as a vendor, you have to go when you're going to be in front of the partner to try to bring them into your ecosystem or create an ecosystem with them as we're talking about partnering the effort is a lot heavier today that you're going to need to produce is a lot heavier today than it used to be 20 or 30 years ago right i agree with that much and you, today, right? much 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 heavier uh you can, the, the way i look at it is um you know it's <clears throat> the, the conversation is largely about control and um, vendors wanting to have a level of control on uh, on their indirect sales organization, which is the partner community. And this control is is now very hard to achieve because, of course, like uh, as you were saying, Jill, beforehand, you know, partners were basically the representatives of the vendor. Yeah, I, I'm an authorized, uh, you know, such and such dealer, or I'm an authorized such and such partner, and that that's kind of the positioning that they had. That 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 time is long gone. Now, mm -hmm. each business, each uh, each partner is their own business and they they have their own ideas and they are their own company. And the vendor's importance is completely like it's it shrunk a lot. Right. They're just a, a tool. They're just one of many tools that the partner has to deliver the solutions that they want to deliver to the client. And so therefore, in that world. The vendor no longer has the, as you said, the leverage to be able to say, well, we'd like you to do this. We'd like you to uh, work on these leads. We'd like you to give us leads. It, it, it's the balance of power has shifted dramatically. The way I look at it and the way I explain it often, and maybe it's a bit simplistic, is um, like the, the, par the partner is like a plumber and uh, he's got a toolkit. He or she has a toolkit. And in that toolkit, you have all of the different vendor gadgets, right? but it's them that are delivering the solution the solution might be fixing the sink or something and they will use whatever tools that they need to use in order to deliver that need that the customer has so therefore if you're the person selling let's say the screwdrivers how do you go about making your reseller accountable and uh, how do you turn that relationship into a partnership right really 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 hard um it can be done and it's got to be done, but the, the, the game has changed uh, dramatically, right, Jill? Well, I, I, I personally, I don't think it's a matter of uh, necessarily of accountability uh, when it comes to the partner. And going back to the notion of control, um, control has always been a problem, right? Especially who owns the customer and, and this type of thing. I mean, it's... Uh, it's always been an issue, and I've I've been also, hearing. But it's also pipeline visibility, because the vendor wants that and needs that, and the partners don't want to share that, right? So it, it goes. Uh, uh, I, I don't think that yeah. the partners don't want to share that. Um, uh, going back to what I was trying to say, it's like, um, again, I think today the the your idea of um, vendors being a tool. Uh, for the uh, and and not in a negative sense of tool, right? But in in a tool in the toolkit of what a given partner is going to leverage to try to get into new account or to solidify uh, existing accounts and all that. I completely agree with that, right? Uh, after that, we can look into the details and all that. 
uh, this is part of the partnership. And I, I don't think uh, partners have a hard time sharing pipeline uh, with vendors. Uh, providing the partnership is a good one. Um, I, I don't think this is particularly an issue. I think the issue is is the assumption that a lot of vendors are going to be um, bringing to a given partner or set of partners that you know it's obvious why those uh, partners need to resell our solution, right? We're, we're like, and there's no such thing as as being obvious, right? I mean, unless again, I use the same example, un unless you're a completely game changing vendor with a completely net new product that is going to revolutionize the environment in which you're operating. Uh, and the only example I have in mind is when, uh, when VMware launched, right? A VMware launched with a value proposition that was absolutely stellar and they had zero competition for, you know, a period of time. And at this point, everybody wanted to resell VMware, right? And VMware pleaded very intelligently at this point uh, in the sense that they didn't, they didn't use this as a tremendous leverage by giving crappy margin and, and very harsh condition for the partners to know. They embraced everybody that was willing to promote their, their new solution, right? Um, but they had a unique value proposition, no competition, and they were, they were capable of showing that by implementing the VMware solutions, um, the, uh, uh, the benefits for the end user were tremendous. And, and undeniably tremendous, unless you have something like that. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to guess 99 points, maybe 100% today of solutions that are coming out are not in that VMware concept category, right? Uh, you got to do things differently because nobody's going to beg to resell your product. No one. Uh, you got to keep in mind when you go to, a, especially when you're a startup or, or, or a small company, and you go to a partner, they were not like dying for this meeting to happen, right? They had absolutely zero need of you before the meeting. And unless you convince them that you can bring something, uh, that together you can bring something to customers and prospect that's going to make the sales accelerating and, and the pipeline growing and all that kind of stuff and, and bringing a solution on the market that's going to be absolutely great, uh, they're not going to need you after the meeting. Uh, right, so, but it's it's, it's just uh, the same as as uh, the um, plumber example, right? You know, how does a screwdriver vendor uh, say to the plumber, "You really need this screwdriver," right? The the decision is uh, in the hands of the partner. So even so, I kind of disagree a little bit, just because sometimes Phil and I need to disagree, uh, and I disagree on the fact that I think there are vendors that that partners, at least in recent times, have been, you know, killing to be a partner of, like, for example, AWS, I think is a good example. Uh, there's a respectability that comes from being an AWS partner. It's very much in demand. Um, now it's, of course, uh, times of, uh, are changing again, and that 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 glitz is going. Yeah? But it's uh, the partner that goes shopping for the tool. It's the partner that says, I need this screwdriver, I need this vendor, right? And, uh, and so, therefore, there, there's a loss of control because the screwdriver vendor has no no ability really to capture the time and the imagination of the of the um, reseller or the partner to say my solution is really good for you because um, it's got to kind of be it's got to be done in reverse it's got to be you've got to empower and enable and somehow inform the partner community with without being too invasive, <clears throat> but to inform them on, uh, on why they, that your, your tool can be extremely valuable for them. And that, that's really the, uh, the conundrum. The conundrum is that it's, it's very hard to get the attention of the partner community, right? So uh, I'm going to send it back to you. I disagree with you. <coughs> um, and the reason why I disagree with you is because uh, the vendor approaching a partner by selling you absolutely need this screwdriver this is 30 years ago today you don't go to a partner and say you need my solution no we're great we're saying you go to a partner and you say and you what you're trying to sell is the partnership not the solution that is attached to the partnership if you haven't done your due diligence before as a vendor and you do not yet understand whether or not your solution is fit for the market and in particular in this relationship with a given partner 
it is fit with their go-to-market strategy. It is complementary to what they're doing and it's going to help them acquire net new customers or solidify relationship with existing customers and all that. You got to pause your partnership ecosystem and start by doing this because this is really, really the absolute best line to try to sell your solution. Uh, and, and, and just like any sales cycle and getting new partners is very akin to a sales cycle. If 30 years ago you were explaining everything and all that, today about 80% of that sales cycle has always all already been consumed by whoever is the customer or the partner in the case you're selling a partnership to these people, right? So they know your solution already. By the time the meeting happens, they already know your solution. They already know if there's a good fit and all that. They're going to expect other things from you that have nothing to do with your solution. Because if they don't believe that your solution is a good drug fit for or a good market fit for whatever it is that they're going into in terms of market or can help them open net new markets uh, for them, for example, they're in financial services and they want to go to healthcare or, you know, for larger partners, maybe they want to have access to a different geo or things like that. Um, if they don't believe that the meeting is not happening. As simple as right. that. They don't have the time, right? So it's it's they're not gonna say, yeah, no, sure. I mean, we're an IT company. You're selling screwdrivers. Yeah, absolutely. Let's have a meeting because we know about a couple partners that need screwdrivers. They a couple of customers that need. Not happening. So for me, and this is what I was explaining. There's a bunch of things that were the the meat of the market, uh, the meat of the uh, of the program that vendors would build together and put together and all that. And they would bring this to the partner and say, look, we protect your investment today. Uh, we have a very solid opportunity registration program and we'll give you 20 points of margin and we'll give you that spiff and we'll do this and do that and we'll help you with MDF or co-op dollars and all that kind of stuff. All this is baseline today, baseline. If, if you don't go above that today, uh, it, it's uh, you're just, a me too vendor in the sense of, you know, channels, uh, not so, in the sense of your product, but in the sense of channels, you're just a me too vendor. I, I hear you. I hear you. And I, I think here there's two parallel conversations really that need to be had um, in relation to the topic I'm saying. Uh, one is uh, how, you know, how do we, the, the sense of the value proposition in terms of uh, developing a brand new relationship with a partner, how to mm -hmm. show value as a vendor in, in initiating a relationship, so in partner recruitment. Uh, and then there's the other, uh, maybe bigger even challenge, which is once you have a partner, what value do you need to bring to them? And what value do they expect from you? Um, and maybe maybe uh, I'd like to dig a little bit more into that side of things, because uh, I think that, 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 I mean, if that's okay with everybody, I think it's such, a, such an important point. Uh, and uh, so many people have partnerships and have a large channel and uh, they're not, they're not seeing the results that they that they expect uh and so you know maybe one of the reasons is that they're not showing value to the partnership um what do you guys reckon yeah do you want to continue or or, we, or Aaron, do you want to interject with something on this before we uh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna derail you guys. So we talked about sales pipelines and uh, vendors delivering leads uh, to the partners. Uh, so we had a question uh, from uh, the comments on uh, you know how the market is getting so stringent where the uh, the vendors face the issue of the partners uh, wanting sales ready leads before uh, going for a complete sales pipeline. Some of them, yeah, some of them do. So that depends on your ecosystem of partners. I mean, I know partners, they absolutely, uh, I mean, they will always accept uh, you bringing them an introduction to an account they don't have yet or something of that nature, right? Uh, of course, but for some smaller partners, the concept of bringing them uh, leads is extremely important for them because they don't have the lead machine that maybe the vendor has, right? And they're a small partner, but uh, yet they corner two or three customers, maybe just one, um, that they absolutely have total control over. And I have multiple examples of that. A lot of partners, a lot of uh, resellers were incepted because of one relationship with a particular end user. 
and uh, and and their development, you know, uh, stem from that. But that's still their core, uh, their core customer. And if you don't go through this partner to try to sell anything into that particular uh, end user, you're you're, you're good luck. Uh, it's going to be difficult. <clears throat> um, but uh, but it it varies, Aaron. So, and my point is not to say there is an absolute science that says here's the 110 dimensions in uh, you know a partner system that or a partner ecosystem that you need to have in place to a T so that you're going to have a very successful ecosystem. There are 110, if not more, dimension in the entire concept of a partner ecosystem. However, uh, the, the one-size-fits-all approach that we used 20 or 30 years ago is not valid anymore. That, that's also my mm -hmm. point. So does it defeat a little bit the concept of scaling when it comes to developing a partner ecosystem? Absolutely. That's a problem. Right. But now you have to customize your approach uh, to different partners because and, and I'll send people back to our former version of the taxonomy of partners. Right. You have to understand how to differentiate your partners. So it, it doesn't have to be like a different program, a different approach for each and every one of your partners. But at least you have to have like some level of taxonomy. So maybe you don't go all the way down to the genus, but you stop at the class or the family and you can start, you know, tweaking a little bit your approach to these partners based on common factors that this group has versus that group versus this other group, right? Yeah. It's and important to do that. Uh, but then you you will be faced at times with a partner that is that you believe as a vendor is absolutely critical for you or could be very critical for you. And they're going to have uh, some idiosyncrasies in their request and their demand and things that they need and all that. And my advice is to be flexible as a vendor to be able to accommodate these things as much as yeah. possible. So, which is a great thing because flexibility is what startups uh, are very capable of versus an IBM, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, sure. it, it's it's easier yeah. for them to do it, and it's easier for them to, uh, and it's faster for them to execute on, you know. Um, very customized approach to something, right? So I'd like to comment on that as well, but I think that Aaron has got a, a burning uh, comment as well. No, no, I was going to say, you know, Carlo, I'm curious to see how you feel this yeah. fits into bringing that value to the partner so, once you so, already have the um, partner. You know, I think it plays is, well into that. This is a wonderful question, um, and it opens up the whole the whole uh, can of worms of uh, leads, <laughs> lead triaging and passing leads to to partners, right? Yeah. So. Yes, uh, the, the commentator there uh, has a point, it's getting more stringent, and it ought to, right? So uh, generally speaking, the, the many partners receive a lot of dross, and what they don't have time for is um, a waste of time, right? They are lean uh, and mean machines. They have to operate really efficiently. The salespeople are high earners. Um, their time is precious, and they don't want to spend time chasing uh, a lead that is maybe just a potential lead that needs a lot of chasing or chasing a lead that might be an important lead but just really hard to get a hold of or they don't have time for any of that really right so um so i, th I think that the, the point i'd like to make here is um has multiple facets but essentially uh i want to bring it back to the ethics of partnering and uh what does it really mean to be a partner so when you partner with a with a partner <laughs> Uh, you absolutely want to be there for them, build a business together with them. That's the point. That's the idea of a partnership is let's build a business together. Uh, and it's pretty much on equal terms, really. So you need to spend time, have skin in the game and, and show, show them that. And the way you show them that is uh, by supporting them, in my opinion, by supporting them in the best possible way when it comes to lead uh, passing. Right. So in, in the past, uh, one of the biggest problems that I saw in the channel was that there was no uh, uh, understanding from the vendors of what the business model was of the partners. And this is especially for large vendors that have multiple product dimensions, et cetera. So they would actually pass a lead that was totally inappropriate to, to, to the partner. Um, and I go back to the idea, for example, of value uh, against volume. Right? You don't want to pass a consultative lead to, to a transactional partner and vice versa. And that sort of thing was happening all the time, right? And it still happens a lot today. So partners receive leads that are not quite the right fit for their business, right? 
Um, that's one problem. The other problem is they get a lead. Sometimes these leads are marketing lady ready leads rather than sales ready leads. And that really frustrates the partners, right? Because they are perceived as a sales ready lead, but they're not really. And many partners don't have the infrastructure to transform a marketing ready lead into a sales ready lead, right? So what do you do about that? And I think that it's uh, it's on the vendor to, ideally, it's on the vendor to have that machinery in place to warm up marketing ready uh, mar marketing leads into into sales ready leads. But if they are not going to do that, to at least have a roundtable conversation with a partner to say, okay, let's work on this together. We're going to be passing you marketing ready leads, and we will devise. A process together that will turn these into sales ready leads for you right now having said that i'd like to just reference a case study uh, of uh, when i've seen this work extremely well at least us as an agency at gorilla we work for a number of different vendors and different vendors um, treat their partners in different ways now one uh, vendor experience that i had uh, in the past which was however phenomenal was with oracle and the deal there was we will not pass uh, on this program we will not pass leads to the two partners that are not uh, absolutely sales ready right so what we mounted was a uh, first of all a very strong lead machine uh, to generate leads um it really in great volumes <clears throat> and uh, and then what we did is that we actually put in a secondary stage of uh, uh a field uh, sales, um, pre-sales personnel, it's essentially like uh, sales engineers comboed with uh, sales representatives that would have virtual or uh, at the time even more personal meetings with target target customers, data center managers. And um, we set this up at, at, at the rate that each rep, each of our reps had two to three meetings a day uh, with new customers. And these were uh, deep uh, pre-sales meetings that would go through uh, a health check to assess the various needs of the customer, to define the project in, in detail. And only then would the lead go to the, um, to the uh, partner. Now, that level of uh, pre-qualification, if you like, of a lead before sending it to the partner is something that is very rarely done. Uh, but when it's done, and when it's done correctly, like we did it was a phenomenal uh, phenomenal result because from memory now something like 50% uh, of the leads that we generated this way led to um a, a, a actual uh, factored pipeline opportunity and 50% of those closed so and this is on on high, relatively high value data center products ranging between 30,000 and 300,000 dollars a pop so this was an exceptional pro, uh, idea of let's take it to the extreme. Let's, you know, it was an investment, but it was an investment that was completely worth it because uh, uh, whilst the efficiency actually made the cost of the, the, the sale, cost of goods sold lower than it had ever been before, uh, but it actually increased mid-market sales by like 100%, right? So it was an incredible, incredible way of actually generating sales-ready leads. I'm an advocate of that type of thing. It can't always be done. It's sometimes complex to do. If you can't do that sort of thing with your partner for your partner, and if you're going to be sending them marketing leads, then at least uh, have an adult conversation about it and say, listen, we're going to give you marketing leads these leads are going to frustrate your sales team so we'll work out together a process to turn them into something solid um just just uh my thoughts on it yeah great uh there was a little bit of a follow-up on highlighting uh what the approach should be and kind of how the market's changing so we touched on a little bit of that <clears throat> uh, go back and kind of highlight that uh, so are we going back to the uh value prop to the partners um okay so in the logic I was talking about earlier, uh, the point is to say, um, so it's, it's, I, I assume every company is going to have a value proposition for their customers, right? Which this becomes a tool later when you have a partnership with 
a given a, a set of partners, right? Their, their salespeople are going to be using this. This is not what you want to put in front of your partners. What you want to put in front of your partners is a value proposition to your partners. So the example that Carlo was giving, given, for example, that can very well fit into this because I, I guarantee you will find a lot of partners that don't have time to uh, further qualify MQLs into SQLs, but some will, right? So again, um, to answer the person who asked about a methodology to go at this and all that, it's uh, it's actually super simple. It's uh, in theory, it's super simple. Uh, first, you need to, uh, so you don't do the exercise for every new partner, you need to have this taxonomy of partners in place, right? So you need to identify, first you're gonna identify as a vendor, you know, who is it that you think uh, is the best fit for what it is that you wanna promote through this partnership, number one thing. And then within that pool of partners that are gonna fit within this, you're gonna start differentiating the different types of partners, right? You're not gonna deal with a three people company, uh, reseller as you're going to deal with an optive or a guide point or a worldwide technology and so on and so forth so you want to be able to differentiate not only by size but many other factors depending on what it is that you're uh, that you're doing or what your solutions are uh, once you have this established uh, and my advice has been the same for the last five uh, presentation we had go talk to a few of them the one you already have a good relationship with right and, and try to build, um, you know, a Venn diagram, uh, as simple as that, uh, where there's three circles uh, intersecting. Same one you're going to do for a value proposition, usually. And if, uh, if, if nobody sees what I'm talking about, I have a picture right here that I can share. But uh, there's what your company is offering in the, in the realm of, that, of partnerships, right? Again, I'm not talking about product here, solutions, hardware, software, services. I'm talking about partnership, purely partnership. So there's your company, and it is all the things you can possibly offer in a partnership, right? Then there's your competition, and there's all the things they can offer in a partnership. And then there's the partners. And the partners' circle represent what they want. And I insist on what they want, because on most Venn diagram, you're going to see what they need. Your assumption of what they need is irrelevant completely irrelevant even if they're wrong uh you can over time convince them that they need different things than what they want but what really matters same for customers what really matters is what they want right and you're not going to find this out unless you've known them for a long time and you've operating with them a long time and you understand their go-to-market strategy and how they operate as a business and so on and so forth and what are their you know one year three year five year plans and all that kind of stuff you're going to understand this by talking to a few sample of each and every one of them. Well, a few sample of them for each and every one of the different category you will have defined in a taxonomy, right? And that can help you start building a value proposition that you're going to put in front of them. Because for everything you think you're offering that is a differentiator, oh, we give 20 points of margin and we have a super solid uh, you know, opportunity registration and we pass on leads and we do this and do that. This is really the baseline. Again, like everybody does that or maybe not everybody, but 90% of the vendors do all these things, right? And But talk to them uh, because maybe your partner is going gonna, is gonna to leverage the circle of your competitor by saying, you know what? And, and by the way, in partnership, your competitors are not the ones selling the same stuff that you're selling. It's every other vendor that is on the line card of a partner. And I insist on that, right? If you're selling servers and another company is selling storage uh, through the same partner, they are a competitor of yours because if that partner spends more time selling storage than they spend selling servers, you know, they're eating on your mindshare. And and so, but the partner, when you're going to talk to them, is going to say company XYZ, which might be a competitor of yours or not uh, in the market, but definitely is in the partnership, uh, is doing this or they're doing that and we love it, right? Or they're doing this and <laughs> they're doing that and we hit it. They're going to give you a lot of information that are going to help you build that value proposition you're going to put in front of partners. Right. And you got to be honest about it. Right. I mean, you're not going to duplicate things they do that you're not capable of doing. You're going to duplicate things they do that 
maybe you assumed was kind of a given or something, but now you want to make sure that you're going to put this in the forefront of your value proposition to your partners for creating a partnership when you're going to talk to them. And that's draw another, that's, uh, that's uh, make me think of another thing. Don't assume anything. Uh, it, it's like, it's everything you're going to put in front of them has to be explicit, not implicit. You're going to assume that they believe that you're protecting their, um, you know, their registration. You're going to assume that you're going to pay them at, you know, whatever term you're going to, you know, all those you know, make, make everything very explicit uh, because some will ask you and you'd better have the answer to this. Right. So mm. this has to fit always within the three pillars of, of, of what's, but that, that is something you can define, or at least two of them you can define very early on before you even start talking to your first partner, right? Um, the same three pillars are, you know, the relationships, uh, the simplicity or the ease of doing business rather, and the relevance that you have, right? So if you're selling screwdrivers, because uh, Carlo likes screwdrivers, uh, and you go to an IT firm, chances of striking a partnership with, uh, with an IT type partner are very, very limited, very limited. Uh, but so you have to be relevant somehow in not only the product fit and uh, the market you're touching and the geos you're touching and, you know, um, all of those things that are existing, but also with the thing that are not yet existing, which are aspirations from your partners. You know, maybe your partner wants to go in a direction that your solution is going to help them. Uh, as an entry point for new customers in that particular area and all that. You're not going to know that if you don't talk to them. So the sum is when you're going to put a value proposition in front of them, the question you want to answer usually is what unserved or underserved customer need will this partnership help with, right? Or even if it's not underserved or unserved at all, even if it's already served, what can we do together that will help you, Mr. Customer, to reinforce your position or to solidify your position with your existing customers? That's important for them because they compete every day with other partners, right? Uh, other resellers or other MSSPs or whatever. So that, that's one question you want to answer. Uh, absolutely. This is a constant. You always want to do that. And the other one is, depending on this, has nothing to do with the customers, but has to do with the prospects is what you know solution can we put together in place you know what as we combine forces is this going to help you access new customers right because they and and legion is one thing you know that you're going to offer and that kind of thing but it has to fit within a strategy that they have in mind and maybe it's it's yeah. just poorly etched right now and you can help them flesh it out a little bit better by showing them and demonstrating that you know proof points uh, by offering this to the customer, we're going to help you to this prospect. We're going to help you get into this prospect, right? Because we're working on them and all that. And we work on them together and all that. And we have no problem with you, you know, everything being on your paper. Because we understand, Mr. Partner, that once you'll be in this customer with this, you'll be able to try to sell everything else that is on your line card. And you have to think this way all the time, right? So it's also, uh, uh, it's also very valid for leads. Uh, where I've seen so often partners having a lead machine, uh, vendors having a lead machine and like feeding leads to their partners based on the fact that those leads were was addressing uh, or was uh, centered around the solution the vendor was offering. But they would never pass on the other leads. They would just discard the other leads. So again, I'm going to take the example of servers and storage. Um, and it was like, okay, I'm a, I'm a storage vendor, right? And suddenly I have a lead that says, well, no, you know, we're company XYZ. We don't really need storage, but we absolutely need uh, servers. What do you do with that lead? Because you have this tunnel vision as a vendor most of the time, you're like, well, this is not of any interest for us, right? Let's dump it. We're not going to pass this on. Well, guess what? Your, uh, your partners are also selling servers. You're doing only storage, but they're also selling servers. Give the lead to your... Uh, uh, to your partners, they'll be happy. Even if it doesn't serve you directly, they'll be happy with you. I can guarantee that, right? And now they will have a way to get into maybe a net new customer into which over time, what are they going to try to sell? Not only servers, they will now try to sell also storage. And guess what? They have a partnership with you. They're going to try to sell your storage or whatever other solution. I'm just taking this as an example. So the net net is talk to them. 
you know, ask them what it is that they like, what it is that they don't like, and, and take it from there. That will help you build your value proposition to your partners. So adding to that, uh, I'd like to uh, just uh, mention in terms of providing value to, uh, to the partners. Again, this is uh, my experience as an uh, agency leader, right? Uh, what, what, I, what I've been seeing is um, that one of the most valuable things that they need Apart from you know the real commitment and the relationship that comes through, but you know by being there, but being supportive, by showing the love, right, is uh, is um, information uh, usable information. I would say, right. So a lot of people are saying, well, you know, data is the new petroleum, uh, and, and it really is. And we're seeing that now with this uh, whole AI revolution and everything. Um, but the most important thing is that the you know the data needs to be uh, really, really. Uh, it has to be information, and it has to be usable. You know, uh, one of the ways that I've seen that work successfully in industry is with the concept of running um, propensity to buy analyses on uh, a customer base, or on a prospect base. Now, usually, what I've seen is that vendors say to their partners, "Look, let me do." a customer propensity to buy analysis on your database of customers that way you can sell more of our product quicker and it, it's a proposition that makes sense i i think it's invasive in that well it's invasive in many different ways you know your part your customer base is kind of your treasure you don't necessarily want to open that up to uh to a vendor right but of course it makes sense because if you do uh if you apply ai for example on a uh, propensity to buy analysis on a database, you probably sift through and get a very clear idea of which are the prospects that you should be working with. And we've seen that work extremely well. But there's that the whole diplomacy of how do you approach that conversation? How do you guarantee them um, security on that data, et cetera, et cetera. And we could talk about that for ages. Then there's the, the flip side of that, which is um, prospects pr propensity to buy analysis. Now that's that's much harder to do because you have less transactional data points, but you have uh, other data points that can come in, like sociological, uh, psychological, uh, behavioral data points. Yeah, and everybody's saying now the future of the internet is not it's beyond the Internet of Things; it's the Internet of Behaviors, right? And that's what we're the whole AI world is tracking, right? So when it comes now to prospect prospecting better, essentially that's all it is. In my opinion, going to a partner, the the best way to go to a partner is to say, look, I can really help you with, we can work together on new customer acquisition for you. That's a better proposition, in my view, than to say, let me take a look at your back pockets and have a look at your install base so that I can take some customers out of it. That's a, I, I think that's a little bit invasive. It's been done. It's been done successfully to to the success of both vendor and partner. So I'm not saying that's a bad idea. I'm saying just that that needs special delicate handling. But a much more pro, um, positive and thought provoking proposition is let's do new customer acquisition together. Let's use the power of AI to be able to do that sort of thing, right? And this then takes me to uh, another point. And you guys park a thought if you have a thought around this uh, th th this idea. Um, I'm just looking at the time because I'd like to open up a very contentious point, which is uh, what do we do about funded heads? Uh, is that a relic of the 80s and 90s or is there still a place for funded heads? Again, no, just, it, it's, to it's, idea, it's... just to see the idea, what I've, what I've been told by clients is, look, we need funded heads, but the funded heads that we need is uh, sales engineers. They're the most sought after kind of funded heads. Mm hmm in pre-sales situations post sales no because a partner then wants to make the money with their own engineers but well, I mean, it, it, it it depends um it, it depends on the sale make sales mechanism sales motion sales structure of a vendor usually how it works right um when when things are extremely delineated between a direct sales team and a partner team or a channel team which that's personal i think it's it it's so 1990s, uh, but it's um, uh, yet most of the companies still operate with even brand new companies. I mean, the last one I was in was like, I don't know, we have our sales team and we have our channels, right? I mean, it's like, 
uh, in a world where everything should evolve towards the concept of hybrid sales organization, right? Like an ecosystem that composes, you know, if you want to have direct sales, good. Um, you have direct sales, but the same people that are going to have to sales are going to be the one driving also the partnerships and all that kind of stuff. And all that. I, I, we'll talk about that. We'll have a, a specific webinar on hybrid sales teams or sales slash channel teams. But the concept of funded head comes from that usually. And if you're very delineated uh, in the sense that at some point you're going to want to impart a certain level of knowledge that is going to be dedicated to your brand, right? And not your typical SE, for example, or pre-sales engineer, you're going to have at, at, a, at a reseller is going to have in his head a lot of brands and he's going to have the ability to talk about many, 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 many different things. So you want some kind of exclusivity. Well, that comes out as a cost, right? And the cost is that you're going to fund that person that's going to work exclusively for that particular partner and is going to represent exclusively what it is that you have. Is it a good thing, a bad thing? I've been in programs where it was absolutely magnificent and the return on funded edge was well worth the money. And I've been, uh, and I've seen programs where it was a scam, uh, where partners were using the funded head for more so than the vendor that was paying for it. And uh, certainly not at the full benefit of what it could have been and sometime even at a loss. Right. So the concept still exists. It's very prevalent uh, in the distribution business. Uh, it's very prevalent with some significantly large uh, resellers that can, you know, bring a return on investment that justify usually those type of thing. And if it's perfectly um, within the usual boundaries of the use of MDF. So if you can generate MDF to the point as a partner to the point that you're going to be able to finance uh, partly or fully, uh, somebody dedicated to promote a specific line of product. Uh, why not? I mean, it's 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 not dead. It's not. It's uh, uh, again going back to the assuming that this is something great uh, is a mistake. Uh, right. Talk to your partner and maybe put in place a program that says by by the time we achieve those uh, and they they may not have anything to do with revenue usually they do but by the time we achieve those milestones together blah 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 uh we'll co-finance somebody that is dedicated to promoting our solution as a vendor so, or that kind of stuff it's it, it's it's all on the table I'm the, all those things Carlo, that we're talking about the lead and this yeah. these are the details of what value you bring to the table uh i'm trying to stay above that know, without yeah. getting into the details right so that that that's why but it, it's uh there's there's a number of tools that can support a very very powerful value proposition between a vendor and a partner and those are all those tools right and there's a million others right my what I'm trying to impart here to the audience, right? From from my experience, and it's only me again. It's I'm not the god of channels. Um, is to say there is an initial approach which involves you know you understanding what the partner wants, not what the partner need. Again, the, what what the partner wants, right? And you're not going to find that unless you go talk to a representative sampling of those partners to understand if there is any trending, any common points to all of them that you absolutely need to have in your value proposition to put in front of them. Like, do that because this, those partnerships evolve every day or every week or, you know, but they evolve very rapidly to the point that, you know, you need to keep abreast of that and make sure that every time there's a new want from one of your partner, you're one of those vendors that can address it, for example. You know, I, I think it's a great point. And, it, and I would like, uh, <laughs> Je dirais même plus. Uh, I would even say more that I would go to the partners with uh, with uh, with a set of ideas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so when you when you you're right, you, you you must talk to the partners and and get you know get a sense of what they really need. Very often, because they're you know very efficient sales organizations doing leading and selling on their own value proposition, really, uh, it's difficult to. Say to them, what do you want uh, from us without giving them 
uh, uh, necessarily a bunch of ideas, uh, which is why I think so. Yeah, because uh, uh, they they will often say, well, I, I don't know. I'm running my business. I'm doing my thing. What can you offer me? <laughs> it's kind of the response that you might you might often get. So. My so advice, if you, if you, I agree with you if you're like if you're if you're a channel manager or and and you you started your role in the channels like three months ago and you don't have your network of relationships and all that I agree with you if you've been in the market 20 years and you know you know 200 CEOs of 200 resellers and MSSPs and and you know news companies you have relationship in place these people will, you know, like around a lunch or around drinks or whatever. I mean, some yeah. of them will be your friends after 20 years, hopefully. Uh, and, and I always go to the same, like I've been in this 23 years. I always go to the same 15 partners yeah. because their CEOs is still the same person. And I've known them for the past 20 years and I can ask them everything and I can run anything by them and say, Hey, what about if every single one of my channel, if I'm a new vendor, every single one of my, uh, uh, channel manager wears a bunny outfit uh, when they come and visit you guys. Is this going to be better? And he's gonna, you know, most of them are gonna say no. Uh, and but you know, I can I can open anything, any can in front of them, and they will react to it very transparently without saying, "Well, first come with something, and then I'll see if I talk to you." No. So you have you. I'm assuming a lot of people in this audience already have those type of relationship in place because it doesn't take ten years to build that. And, and when you ask people nicely and say, hey, Michael, is Michael the CEO of one of those uh, resellers in the Southeast? Uh, you know, I'm thinking of putting this, 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 and this in place. Can we have a discussion? Because I really need your help to vet whether or not it's going to work or what, what, what are your two cents about it, right? And you do that 20 times, you're going to see some trending coming out, right? Sure. Not 200 times, 20 times. You know, you're, you're going to be good. You're going to have IDs coming out. So leverage that. I mean, like use your relationships uh, to to test your stuff before you put it in front of a completely unknown partner that you've never talked to before. Right. Uh, leverage those relationships with the partners you already have that are working well with you. Try to identify what are the things they again, ask them, you know, what it is that we're doing that you love, what it is that we're doing that you don't like. And then ask the same question about your competitors, again, all the other things that are on their line card and ask them, you know, is there something that one or two or whatever number of your other vendor partners uh, that they're doing that is absolutely stellar, that your salespeople love, that your AC love, that your marketing team love and this and that, right? And and if there is such a thing, tell me what it is. I'm going to try to replicate it. So, Jill, yeah. you... you bring up a nice uh, point. So this is a lot of things that vendors can do uh, to, to bring, you know, value in, in speaking with their resellers. So where do vendors fail when they think they're bringing um, value to the channel? And I know we only got seven minutes left, so that might not be enough time, but I wanted to get it in. Well, assumptions, number one, they know, right? They know what those uh, partners need. Uh, living in the past, uh, in the sense that what Carlo was explaining, um, partners are an extension of our sales force. They are not an extension of your sales force. They're not even on your payroll. Uh, I mean, you have zero control over the vendors um, that are working for a one of your partners. Zero. Absolutely zero. Like, assume that from the get-go, and you'll, you'll be better, right? So, I, and and... And you're going to tell them how to sell, right? I mean, you're not going to tell them how to sell. They know how to sell way better than your salespeople. Maybe not your solution, but as a whole, trust me, uh, usually the, the quality of salespeople I've seen at resellers is a notch higher than the quality of salespeople I've seen at vendor. Bearing some exceptional that I'm talking about, you know, your median curve, one standard deviation on each side. Well, it's usually in favor and, and most programs will assess from data that usually when you leave your solution in the hands of resellers, VARs, MSSPs, and all that, the sales cycle is a little shorter. And it's not only because they control, they already have everything from a procurement standpoint in, in place. It's also because they're better sellers, usually, right? That's their job. That's all they do. Um, so assuming a lot of things, right? D don't like go really at it with an open mind and listen to what they have to say rather than saying, I always coin it this way. 
what I say is that there's two types of programs out there uh, from a channel perspective. One is called a partner program. And the other one, which composes 95% of all the program I've seen, is called a vendor program. The first one is done by you and the partners, right? When you create your partner program, you're going to talk before you launch it. You're going to test it and, and you know, talk about it with a, a sample of partners that would fit nicely in your ecosystem that you already know. And they will tell you, no, lose that. Why, why do you need silver, gold, platinum? You don't need that. Why do you need this? Why do we have this hurdle or this hoop that we need to go through? It's ridiculous, right? And so on and so forth. They're going to help you streamline it, and they're going to help you add things into it that are relevant for them, right? So those are actual partner programs, 10%. Everything else that people do in a bubble at the office of the vendor, and they say, oh, are we going to do that? And uh, they're going to need to sell $300,000 before they can move from silver to gold and $3 million before they move from gold to plat. And that, all this done in the bubble without consulting, was your, it's called a vendor program, not a partner program. It will say partner program on the front cover, but it's not, you know, your, your partners didn't participate in it. What kind of part, partnership is that? Right? So this is the number one mistake is this lack of communication that you may have and the reason why it fails at the beginning, right? And then there's other stages and all that. And usually that has to do with the follow-up and the love you're providing and the constant listening you need to do with your partner to understand what works, what doesn't work. This in a nutshell, because we have only four minutes. Yeah, yeah let me jump on my orange box before it's too late. <laughs> um, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take advantage of the last uh, two or three minutes there. So for me, uh, the key, the key, areas where uh, vendors should improve um, in terms of uh, showing value to their uh, partners. The, f the first thing I think overall is uh, be a lot more high touch uh, with regards to your partners. So often vendors sign up a partner and they kind of expect, they, they'll set up uh, ground rules at the beginning and expect them to run with it. And then things don't really happen, right? You've got to be high touch. You've got to spend the time um, spend the time uh, as if you can face to face. If you can't have a smart channel manager invest their time and their effort in making them successful, right? So it's about making them successful. So therefore, be generous. Be generous with your information, with your data, with your time, with your inventiveness, with your strategy. Give them all, everything that they can in order to to succeed, right? Um, that's that's really uh, that's really it in my opinion. These are the sort of the core uh, drivers that I think uh, um, really change the way that you show value to a partner. It really starts inside, starts in the heart, and it ends in the wallet. I would add to what Carlos said. Uh, it's not the channel manager role, especially if you're a startup or a small company. It's the whole village. Uh, if, if they feel the love coming from the entire company, they will believe that you're a partner-centric company. Um, Absolutely. Partner naturally trust channel managers and PAMs and CAMs and all that kind of stuff. They naturally trust them uh, because they know those people get paid. They know, you know that their, their business relies on the success of the resellers and the bars and whatnot. Right? So they, it's the rest of the company that has a trust problem especially the sales team for starters, uh, way ahead of the rest, but the executive management team as well. Am I gonna, and if these people never show up, eh, guess what? You know, they know their business is taken care of by one person or a group of person called the channel team, and that's it. If you cannot expand this to, if, if the trust doesn't go further than that, I'm sorry to say it, it's, uh, it's not going to go very far, but anyway. Thank you, Jill. And All right. Thank you, Carlo. Yeah, I thought well, I that, think was, that we kicked it around really nicely. I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, uh, I'd like to uh, also thank everybody uh, for joining us today. It was a really interesting topic and a, and a great discussion. So. Uh, the recording of this will be available on our website at gorillaict.com uh, under our events tab. So you can connect with us on LinkedIn as well. And then please join us for our April event. Uh, so that's going to be part one of our webinar discussion around channel readiness. So, uh, yeah, you're not going to want to miss that. So, all right.
Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.